Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session organized by the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, Homegrown, the impacts of Bill 23 on agriculture across Ontario. My name is Danielle Sharman, and I'm a policy analyst with the OFA, specializing in agriculture economic development, and I will be your moderator for today's session. The webinar will be recorded, and both the slides and the recording will be made available on the OFA website. We've started at 12 o'clock and the presentations will run until 1 p.m. And then from 1 until 1.30, we will have a Q&A session. Questions will be addressed within the chat box. Please type your questions in the box at any time and we will get to them during the Q&A session. I will now provide a brief introduction about today's webinar. Whether we realize it or not, land use planning affects every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives from housing to food production, the environment, the local economy, and more. We know we are losing farmland every day in this province, and at the same time, the province wants to build more homes. The goal for today's session is to provide you all with a background on agricultural land use planning in Ontario and how individuals and county federations can engage in the land use planning process as critical stakeholders. The other goal is to provide you all with some updates on recent provincial housing initiatives in Ontario and how these will impact agriculture. And now I will introduce our speakers. First off, we have Emily Sousa, who's a policy analyst with OFA, specializing in agriculture and rural land use planning and farm property files. Emily obtained a master's in rural planning and development at the University of Guelph. She is currently a candidate registered professional planner with the Ontario Professional Planners Institute. Ben Laforte is a senior policy analyst with OFA, primarily covering assessment, taxation, risk management, and municipal finance policy files. Ben holds two degrees in economics. He completed his undergraduate at Acadia University and his master's at the University of Guelph. And finally, we have Tina Shankula, a policy analyst with OFA specializing in water, environment, and rural issues. Tina holds a Bachelor of Environmental Studies from York University and a Master of Science in Planning, specializing in urban and environmental planning from the University of Toronto. Thank you all for joining us today. And with that, I will turn it over to Emily to kick off the presentation. Great, thanks, Danielle. Had a bit of a trouble there for a moment trying to get myself unmuted, but. Uh, so th thank you, Danielle, for that introduction. And I know Danielle started off our presentation or the introduction by stating, you know, that we know that we're losing farmland in this province. And so to begin, I'm actually going to try to paint everybody a picture of the state of farmland preservation here in Ontario. So, of course, um, we don't need to remind everybody that farmland is an essential resource for the sustainability and security of our food systems, environments, and of course, our economy. However, the capacity of farmland and agricultural industries to provide this value depends on the availability and the quality of that farmland available. So I know at OFA, we talk about these numbers often, but today I just want to reiterate the numbers on the story of farmland loss that of course warrants attention as farmland continues to be at risk with increasing pressure to develop for housing. So what exactly is this story on farmland loss? Well, in Canada, it's important to recognize that over half of our most productive soils, which are class one soils, are right here in Ontario. And within Ontario, farmland makes up less than 5% of our current land base. So we've established that farmland is a productive, valuable, essential, finite, and non-renewable resource. Its value for our local, national, and global food systems is absolutely critical. And yet, as we mentioned, we continuously lose farmland every single day. Based on the 2016 census, Ontario was losing about 175 acres of farmland a day. Most recently, we received the statistics from the 2021 census, and that number has increased to 319 acres of farmland a day. And I'm going to repeat that. That is up to 319 acres of farmland a day. So the rate of farmland loss is increasing. This means, of course, that we're losing our ability to provide safe, affordable, and sustainable food, fiber, and fuel for Ontario, Canada, and the rest of the world. So what exactly does 319 acres look like? Well, it's the equivalent of 1.2 million boxes of cereal or bottles of wine. It is 23.5 million apples, 
or 75.6 million carats, or I always like to put this into urban terms as well, 58 city blocks, uh, 797 hockey rinks, just under 5,000 tennis courts, or just under 50,000 cars. So imagine that, because we're losing that amount of farmland every single day. So we know that we're losing farmland, but what exactly does the census data tell us? So I wanna make it clear that the census measures the number of farmland acres available. It's a question specifically of how many acres of farmland are in production on census day. So this will include land and crops, pasture lands, fallow lands, wetlands and woodlands, and of course, all other lands that make up farmland. And I'd like to give the example of a site that was redesignated for an industrial use, but perhaps the developer is yet to get some shovels in the ground. In the meantime, while it's already been designated to industrial use, the farmer is renting the land and in the interim, because it's being farmed, this is going to be counted as active farmland, um, even though it is destined for development. So any farmland that's not in production anymore will be counted as a loss, whether that is because it's been paved over for urban development or there are other reasons beyond urban development, such as perhaps an aggregate or gravel mine has moved in. Um, or maybe even farmers are leaving agriculture because of viability concerns. Or another option is maybe um, a, a person has bought a, an estate property and they're no longer interested in farming that property. So regardless of the reason, if it's not an active production, it is a loss and it is a, lo a loss of a critical resource. And planning needs to consider all the reasons for farmland loss and creates uh, policies to support farmers' agricultural viability and protect farmland. And an example I like to use is uh, on-farm diversified uses, which help balance farmland protection objectives with opportunities for farmers to develop parts of their farmland to provide additional on-farm revenue streams. So official plans are the primary tool for implementing the provincial policy statement or the PPS at a local level, and their policies have to be consistent with provincial policy. They are the long-term and publicly informed vision for how and when lands will be used in your community. So for example, they'll designate lands based on prime agricultural, rural, commercial, industrial, residential, mixed use, or other uses by their size and location. And they will also outline where necessary municipal services and facilities will be needed, such as water, um, roads, sewers, and areas where your municipality should grow or intensify, which is key, and remember that part, and existing areas where your municipality could improve. They are essential tools as they act for how, um, as the guiding document for how your municipality will grow up to 30 years into the future. And they consist of two components, such as schedules, which are the maps outlining different areas in your uh, community and the policies. So every five years, and I'm sure many of you on the line have probably had to go through this recently, either through an official plan review or municipal comprehensive review, uh, your municipality has to update their official plan. And it's critical to note that the most major farmland loss at the municipal level will likely happen through an official plan review or an official plan amendment. I'm going to talk about why. So many of us are curious to know how much land has been lost to urban development specifically. Um, unfortunately, the census doesn't actually measure this directly, and we have to rely on the number of official plan amendments approved to convert farmland to a different use, um, which provides data that's more accurate and timely. So research shows between 2000 and 2017, Ontario lost 72,000 acres of prime farmland. So just to clarify, that's just prime farmland, not all farmland, through just over 500 official plan, uh, official plan amendments. That's huge. This includes large urban boundary or settlement area boundary expansions, as well as the accumulation of individual amendments incrementally applied over the rural area. And we know this number has grown significantly since 2017, with several municipalities and the Ministry, and Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing bringing thousands more acres into urban boundaries as of late as just a couple of months ago. All of this illustrates the cumulative impact that seemingly small planning decisions have on the grand total of farmland loss in our province. And we all know and recognize that this loss is unsustainable. So we have to plan our communities for the present and into the future, um, and make decisions that firmly prioritize the protection of this land. And that includes designing land use policies and making decisions which keep growth within fixed urban boundaries and intensify urban and settlement areas where possible. So if there's one message I want to send to everybody today, it's that agricultural land preservation and growth management are two sides of the same coin. So you can't be in favor of protecting farmland without supporting intensification within your existing communities.
And of course, the OFA firmly believes that the preservation of our productive agricultural lands for the ability to produce food, fiber, and fuel is, of course, in Ontario's interest. And we support the efforts of our county federations to stem the effects of urban growth on agricultural land within their municipalities. So let's talk about Bill 23. As we have heard, Ontario is facing a housing crisis. And as a result, the provincial government has set a goal to build 1.5 million homes over the next 10 years to build much needed housing all across the province in both rural and urban communities alike. And for context, I found a statistic the other day. The city of Toronto currently has 1.3 million households. So our province is currently looking to build more than that within such a short time frame. At the same time, as we just discussed, we're losing 319 acres of farmland a day. And we have to remember that we can build houses and protect farmland. The two are not mutually exclusive, and we as farming, food, and commodity organizations need to work together to ensure the government recognizes this. However, it's going to be easier said than done. So to help the government achieve the goal of 1.5 million homes, the Ontario legislature proposed and recently passed Bill 23, the More Homes Built Faster Act. This bill is part of the government's housing supply action plan and is an omnibus bill that amends 10 other acts, including the City of Toronto Act, Conservation Authorities Act, Development Charges Act, Municipal Act, Ontario Heritage Act, Ontario Land Tribunal Act, Planning Act, and more. And we're gonna be talking about a few of these today. And there's been a lot of public opposition as to what's been proposed by urban and rural stakeholders alike, as there um, are concerns that farmland and the potential to build affordable transit supportive dense and complete communities is at risk. As well, it's important to note that the province legislated these changes by having Bill 23 receive royal assent on no November 28th, 2022, before the consultation period was officially over. And we have seen this similar, um, we've seen similar last spring with Bill 109, the More Homes for Everyone Act. And it's safe to say that there's been an immense number of changes in the world of land use planning over the last eight months alone. Um, that have come very quickly without much time to fully understand the scope of impacts of what's been proposed. So I am going to talk about some of the changes that have occurred in the Planning Act. So to begin, let's chat about the missing middle. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, missing middle is a term used in urban planning to refer to all the types of housing that fall in between a detached single family home and a large apartment building. These tend to include duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, and small apartments. And we all know that the best way to build additional housing and protect farmland is to build inwards and upwards. Well, changes are proposed to allow up to what we call three additional residential units per lot province-wide. And this decision overrides any municipal zoning and allows these units as of right, meaning you can uh, receive approvals for these without having to apply for specific planning act application, such as you uh, previously may have required a zoning bylaw amendment. And these three units in a primary building or up to are, um, these three units would be three in a primary building or up to two in a primary building and one in an ancillary structure, such as like a garden or a granny suite in the backyard. And these changes will apply to um, what are newly defined as parcels of urban residential land in settlement areas with full municipal water and sewage services. So they will not apply to many rural residential areas. So of course, OFA applauds the provincial government for taking the sweeping measure to intensify housing development within existing urban boundaries. However, we firmly believe that the government should take a more assertive approach to end exclusionary zoning, which allows for these single detached houses um, and uh, allow for more mid to higher densities beyond just three units as of right province-wide. And this could include townhomes and walk-up apartments. Otherwise, this current proposal would create just 50,000 of Ontario's ambitious goal of 1.5 million homes, which for, um, if you do the quick math there, that's just over 3% of the total amount of homes they're hoping to build. So this fails to avoid and minimize sprawling types of development. So Bill 23 looks to eliminate the planning responsibilities from several upper tier municipalities. Currently, these include the regions of Durham, Halton, Niagara, Peel, uh, Waterloo, York, and the County of Simcoe. However, amendments would allow for additional upper tier municipalities to be added to this list into the future. So what this proposal does is it effectively downloads all previous authority and responsibility of upper tier municipalities, such as county and regions, to their lower tier municipal counterparts, such as your towns, cities, and townships. Some may see that this proposal could streamline planning permissions at the municipal level. However, 
It's unclear how these changes will improve community livability that is connected to core infrastructure um, and overall is integrated and coordinated. So downloading all planning responsibilities and decisions at the local level um, perhaps may lead to uncoordinated decision making, decision making resulting in scattered, inefficient and piecemeal development that could be quite expensive for municipalities to maintain and occurs at the expense of sound regional planning, such as dense transit supportive um, complete communities that protect farmland and the agricultural sector. And so it's also important to remember that some time ago, the province actually introduced regional planning authorities to avoid this exact type of reason. So with this proposal, we are, um, in a sense, taking a step backwards in time. Uh, further, it's also important to remember that upper tier municipalities play critical planning functions in our communities, especially for rural or more small town um, municipalities. Many of Ontario's smaller rural municipalities have only one or half or perhaps even no planners on staff, meaning they don't even have a department, to be able to plan for their community sustainably. So a lot of these upper tier municipalities and examples include uh, counties of Huron, Oxford, Perth, Wellington, and more, have agreements with their lower tier counterparts to provide planning services on their behalf. Also, these upper tier governments most often host agricultural advisory committees that bring farmers' voices and experiences to the table in regional decision-making. So OFA was opposed to this change and urges the Ontario government to protect the planning responsibilities of all upper tier municipalities. So to streamline planning approvals, we also ask that the ministry um, provide the necessary support, such as the additional time, funding, training, and ability to build or bring in expertise um, that are provided to municipalities to enable them to actually utilize these different provincial tools and implement provincial policies to their benefit. So um, elimination of third party appeals. This has been another um, hot topic that has been uh, proposed and passed within Bill 23, More Homes Built Faster. So to provide some background, any decisions on planning applications historically could be appealed, such as official plan amendments, zoning bylaw amendments, and severance or consent applications. And the Ontario Land Tribunal is an independent adjudicative tribunal responsible for hearing and resolving issues on appeals for land use planning applications at the municipal level. So to appeal as a third party, you must have given a verbal presentation at a public meeting or provide a written comment before the council. Um, before the council makes the decision on the planning application to actually qualify and protect your appeal rights in a, um, filing an appeal to the OLT. So, um, you know, it ex this explains why it's so crucial to participate in the land use planning process. And if it's not to share your input or resolve an issue and, you know, maybe perhaps come to a compromise with the municipality on the application, it's also about protecting your appeal rights. However, changes were proposed and passed to limit third party appeals for all planning decisions, except for official plan and zoning bylaw amendments. So, for instance, you can no longer appeal a severance or a minor variance as a third party. The Ontario Land Tribunal has been an essential mechanism for many of our members to appeal planning decisions as a third party and resolve disputes related to land use matters as they relate to their farm properties, farm operations and agriculture more broadly. Ontario farmers increasingly need an appeal process for decisions impacting agriculture, which perhaps may be made by increasingly urbanizing municipalities whose councils and staff may not apply that agricultural lens to their plan, policy or decision making processes. Or perhaps these municipalities have even made errors in issuing planning decisions. For example, several of our members at OFA have relied on third party appeals concerning incorrect minimum distance separation or MDS formulae calculations. This has resulted in development that is too close to their livestock operations and has prohibited farmers from expanding their operations into the future. So OFA is opposed to removing third party planning appeals and urges the government to look for alternative options to address the backlog of appeals and streamline processes at the tribunal. And there is some good news, as I mentioned. So um, originally all third party appeals were um, proposed to be eliminated, but the government has actually backpedaled and of course retained third party appeal rights for official plan amendments and zoning bylaw amendments. Um, so, of course, it is more important than ever to get involved in the planning process to ensure that your voice and input is provided so that municipal council and staff can account for your input when making a decision. 
So Bill 23 also looks to remove the requirement for a municipality to hold a public meeting for a draft plan of subdivision. And while OFA is against removing the requirement to hold a public meeting regarding a draft plan of subdivision, um, this is um, because, or sorry, OFA is against removing the requirement to hold a public meeting regarding a draft plan of subdivision. And there are arguments that this um, specific change might facilitate a more timelier approval um, but we have to remember that it diminishes opportunities for meaningful public in engagement and stakeholder input. So as I mentioned previously with you know, um, elimination of third party appeals, as Ontario becomes more urbanized, farmers increasingly need to engage with their municipalities in land use planning as councils and staff may not apply that agricultural lens to their plan policy or decision making. So public meetings are one opportunity that allows agricultural voices to be heard and thereby represented in a draft plan of subdivision. And this is particularly critical as we increasingly need to plan for farm friendly urban development that promotes compatibility at the urban agricultural interface. The public meeting process could have provided feedback to improve or modify subdivision plan design to avoid, minimize and mitigate potential land use conflicts. And these tools can ensure that agricultural uses continue and that normal farm practices are protected. So I have one last major change before I pass it on to my colleague Ben to talk about changes to the Development Charges Act. So Section 23 of the Planning Act currently enables the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to amend official plans where they believe the plan is likely to adversely affect a matter of provincial interest, such as a range and mix of housing supply or farmland protection. And proposed amendments were passed to eliminate specific procedural requirements where the, that the minister's power is subject to, removing the possibility that the minister request uh, the OLT to hold a hearing on the proposed amendment. So essentially removing the opportunity for municipalities to remedy any non-compliance or concerns when it comes to their official plans. And OFA is opposed to this change and views this proposal as equivalent to issuing an MZO. OFA has continuously emphasized our opposition to the frequent use of MZOs in areas with a robust planning process. And we view this proposed or this newly passed mechanism, sorry, as no different. So for example, several municipalities, and I'll, I'll use Hamilton, Halton, and Waterloo as examples, have created and adopted official plans within the last year that addressed housing supply and affordability within existing urban boundaries. And of course, these types of plans protect farmland. These official plans conformed with provincial policy. Yet, as of November 4th of last year, the minister amended several official plans, adding 2,200 and 3,200 hectares of land, a lot of it prime farmland, into the urban boundaries of Hamilton and Halton, respectively. With overwhelming political and public support, these leading municipalities opted to keep firm boundaries to uphold and protect matters of provincial interest, such as providing safe, affordable housing while protecting farmland. Yet the minister overrode these decisions with little to no justification and no opportunity to appeal the decision. So Ontario citizens deserve a transparent, accountable, and fair decision-making process with the opportunity to provide comments on approving and amending official plans. And municipalities should be able to remedy their official plans according to their local community's interests, needs, and contexts. And OFA requests that the ministry be transparent with the public and the municipality in advance of amending an official plan if it is in the minister's opinion that the plan adversely affect a matter of provincial interest. Doing, show, doing so should include reasons, concerns, detailed analyses, planning justification rationale, and the opportunities for municipalities to respond and remedy any concerns. And rather than grant ministerial authority to amend official plans in the belief that there is a detriment to matters of provincial interest, OFA would like to see the Ontario government create an independent, nonpartisan office of the Legislative Assembly to provide oversight of municipal implementation of provincial land use plans and policies. So thank you so much for listening. I will be joining everybody later on in the presentation, but for now I am going to pass it on to Ben to talk about development charges. Thanks, Emily. Okay, just looking for that, there we go. So yes, I'll uh, run through some of the changes to development charges that were a part of these uh, changes. Um, I'll go through a, a lot, some of the specifics, but the, uh, the headline is essentially that all of these changes will have the same effect, which is reducing the amount of development charges uh, paid by developers and essentially transferring that cost to municipalities. 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit about OFA's response to that and our, and our concerns of what that might lead to a little later on. So our position has always been very clear on development charges, which is they should be set at a rate that covers all of the growth related costs to service new development or that growth should pay for growth. The cost to service growth should be paid by, by those uh, reaping the benefits of, of the, the development. Um, many of the changes to development charges transfer uh, a lot of these costs um, from developers to municipalities and the current property tax base. So um, we're still kind of not sure the exact financial impact this will have, and it will vary significantly by municipality, depending on how much growth and, and development and development charge shortfall there will be in, in each municipality. But early on after the changes were announced, we saw you know, reports from a lot of urban municipalities in the GTA area that could have a 10% or more increase on, on property taxes to cover the shortfall in absence of any additional funding from the province. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that uh, shortly. Um, so in part of our response, um, you know, and asking, A, please, you know, don't go through with some of these changes in development charges, but now that that's kind of a done deal, um, the messaging really about, okay, if we're going to transfer, you know, reduce the cost for developers to develop, um, and that's a decision made by the province, um, the bill should be paid by the province rather than stuck to the municipalities and the, and the property tax base. So municipalities should be compensated by the province for the shortfall in funding that they would face uh, to service new development as a result of these changes. Um, and OFA's longstanding position that we have continued and in our most recent uh, letter uh, after these changes were announced, um, that uh, farm uh, on farm structures like barns, new new on farm construction, be exempt from development charges. Uh, if we go through the next slide, so I'll I'll quickly run through uh, some of the changes, and then I think more more important is a, is a bit more discussion at the end of of kind of the implication of of these changes and, and what we might expect to see. Um, in, in different uh, rural communities, municipalities over the next few years as these, the effects of these changes come, in, come into play. So uh, one of the changes was uh, the change that, it, that development charges have a five-year phase in. Uh, so um, with a, essentially a 20% reduction of what they would have paid in, in the first year, and then the remainder of the development charge being phased in over a four-year period. So you know, easy example, if it was a $5,000 development charge, 4,000 paid in the first year, and then $250 paid uh, over the next four years. So um, essentially stretching out the amount of time that developer would, would be uh, paying for those fees. Um, next slide. Um, another one that uh, is of concern is, is changing of kind of the calculation of development charges. So prior, to these changes, um, the development charge, how much was paid was, was based on, you know, the 10 year history of, of the services uh, um, for that particular service, you know, that the development charge is, is applied to. And that's being proposed, uh, is being now stretched to 15 years, uh, which essentially lower the amount of uh, costs or the amount that the developer would need to pay um, because, you know, the, 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 um, the, the demand for different services uh, grows each year. So the further in time back we stretch that timeline for which the charges are based, the lower the amount um, that is paid. Um, and it's less reflective of what services will be demanded or needed to, to service the, the new development in the future as well. Um, so the lower level of assumed service, lower charge to, to um, developers and the less development charge revenue coming in to cover those costs. Again, that's gonna then be borne by the property tax uh, base. Uh, okay, go to the, to the next slide. Uh, just quickly running through a number of other changes. Again, all of this has a similar effect of, of transferring costs from, from developer to municipality. Uh, parking lot exemption, for uh, attainable housing, so no longer having to provide uh, you know, landing in kind for, for parkland. Um, 
new regulations that set the authority, uh, give the province the authority to uh, set services for which land costs would not be eligible uh, through capital, capital cost recoveries through DC. So um, gives the province more, uh, I guess, power or wiggle room to, to make future changes. Um, excluding the costs of the background study. So every, uh, every development charge by law is required to have a uh, development charge background study, which would, you know, then that's where they do all the math and all the numbers to uh, justify and determine the, the, the specific development charges um, that apply under that bylaw in a municipality. Um, these can be quite expensive. Um, so, you know, now it's, it's that it, the new change here is that the cost of these studies can no longer be recovered through development charges themselves. Um, not a huge cost to, you know, city of Toronto or somewhere like that, where even a very large study is a drop in the bucket. But um, for very small rural communities that don't have, you know, a huge uh, tax base to, to begin with, not working with big, bucket, big budgets, there is a minimum threshold for the costs of these, you know, hiring the consultants to, to, uh, to do these studies. And now that, that cost will be uh, picked up by the property taxpayers as well. Um, the, also the requirement with all these changes to um, have municipalities spend 60% of their development charge reserve for priority services like water and roads. Um, still working with some municipal municipalities to kind of get a better understanding of what that will look like over the next couple of years, how much money will be put out of reserves and what impact will that have on future infrastructure projects? Because part of the, the reason that uh, development charge reserves build up is to pay for future significant infrastructure projects. Um, and discounts for um, units that were that are designed for to be rental units uh, and, and a higher discount for for larger units on top of all of the other development charge changes that um, that have already all gone to effect, which, um, you know, I, on the one hand, OK, it's good there. There's an incentive for higher density there. But again, um, if the, the charges are not sufficient to cover the cost to service that new development, um, again, that would then the shortfall fall on the property tax base. If we go to the next slide. Okay. Um, so again, uh, so our position is that, yeah, development charges should be set at that rate that will cover all of the, the growth related costs to service new development. Even before any of these changes, um, you know, a lot of municipalities um, had development charges that may have struggled to cover the full cost of serving, servicing development. Um, and these changes will, will, will further add strain to, to municipalities' ability to do that. Um, and again, our, our position has been that, that A, that these changes sh you know, should not go forward as were written, but that's again, done deal. So uh, funding should be provided to the municipalities because the last thing we want is for the cost of new development to be borne by the current property tax base. This is a pretty significant issue for farmers in Ontario to begin with, as, as you're all aware that uh, property taxes, farm property taxes over the last 10, 12 years have been going up significantly. So prior to um, 2020, when the assessments were frozen and have not, we haven't got a new impact assessment yet or date, but prior to that, the prior two assessments saw significant increase in farmland assessment relative to residential and commercial. And in many areas, farm property taxes were increasing 10% per year before any of these changes. So, you know, coming off a decade of a very steep increase in, in farm property taxes, um, we don't want to see a situation where we're seeing potentially similar type um, increases in property tax driven not by farmland assessment, but driven by provincial policy, which um, could potentially increase the property tax burden for everyone in the municipality, uh, including farmers, uh, who, as I just mentioned, have already had a, a significant increase in their burden over, over the num number of years. Um, so that's going to be, I think, the, the big issue as we push forward is what does this mean for farm property taxes? What does this mean for farm development charge uh, status? So we continue to push province for a province-wide exemption on development charges for um, on-farm construction for bona fide farm buildings. Um, I, I see that as, as 
very important as these changes go into effect that there is no funding provided by municipalities. Um, they Municipalities do not wanna see a situation where the tax levy for everybody, including residential, is increasing by significant amounts in, you know, in the magnitude of 10% that can be politically unfeasible, um, may lead to a situation where municipalities are looking for every dollar they can find and currently, most municipalities do provide an exemption for on-farm development charges. Um, this is something that I think could be at risk if everything you know, proceeds as is currently outlined without additional funding provided to municipalities. We may have to fight harder and harder to hold on to those um, farm exemptions to development charges because if they're not collecting the, the uh, development charge revenue they need, um, if you don't want to increase taxes by 10 to 12 percent, uh, potentially in certain situations, then, you know, issues like um, exemption for farm development charges could very much uh, be on the table. Uh, so those are the real big concerns that we have of this is the impact that would have financially on, on farmers um, to um, in both property tax and, and the development charge piece. Um, so we'll continue to monitor that. I, I'm not sure fully of what the impacts will be in different communities in rural Ontario. It will be very variable. Um, I'll be watching many municipal budgets this year for the commentary from the treasurers and CAOs um, as a comment on um, you know, projections of what the cost of this, these changes will be um, to each municipality. Um, and, and the impact that might have, have on, on current property taxpayers. So that's it in a nutshell, um, is you know, a lot of these changes are going to, to increase, um, potentially increase property tax burden for our members. Hi everyone, I'm Tina and I am going to be speaking to some of the changes that have occurred uh, to the conservation authorities, as, as Emily mentioned, Bill 23 did impact a lot of different legislation. So in, in the province, there are 36 conservation authorities that are governed by the Conservation Authorities Act and the related regulations, um, but they're also subject to, <clears throat> pardon me, to other, um, other acts uh, and legislation, including the Planning Act. Uh, over the over the num number of years, probably the last three or four four years, there have been many changes to the Conservation Authorities Act. Um, <clears throat> with the most recent being, <clears throat> pardon me, related to Bill 23. Um, we're not quite sure at this time exactly how that's going to play out on the landscape uh, in once it's implemented. But I, I'm going to try and summarize some of the changes that have occurred. Uh, next slide, please. So the ministry in charge of the Conservation Authorities Act was changed. Uh, it's no longer the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change that, that uh, um, rules over the Conservation Authorities. It's now the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. In 2017, uh, a purpose was added to the Conservation Authorities Act, which is to provide for the organization and delivery of programs and services that further the conservation, restoration, development, and management of natural resources in watersheds in Ontario. The, um, uh, the legislative changes back in 2019 and 2020 uh, clarified what the core mandate of conservation authorities um, is to be. Um, and you can see them there, pre preparing and protecting against the impacts of natural hazards, maintaining and managing conservation authority on lands, and their role um, remains in drinking water source protection. Um, and natural hazards uh, are, include um, erosion, flooding, low water, drought, and conservation authorities still maintain their jurisdiction over wetlands and river or stream valleys. Next slide, please. Uh, so under, under Bill 23, with its focus on building more homes faster, uh, resulted in these, the role, uh, changes to the role the Conservation Authority will play in development approvals and issuing permissions and permits. So the Conservation Authorities will, will still review um, uh, permit applications, but they will 
focus only on the risks of flooding, erosion, dynamic beaches, um, as well as unstable soils and bedrock. Uh, and that unstable soils and bedrock was added to the um, oversight of, of conservation authorities. But what was removed was the conservation of land and pollution. So in, in reviewing permits, they are no longer um, reviewing for that. Uh, how does this impact farmers? We know that there's gonna be a lot of development applications, but um, some of the agricultural legislation that, that would be uh, included in conservation authority um, review would be things like the Drainage Act, Endangered Species, um, Environmental Protection Act, Planning Act, um, along with some others, but, but those are the ones of most interest to, to farmers. Next slide, please. So the changes um, will also allow uh, municipalities, which it only municipalities in, that are prescribed by regulation. And to my understanding, those regulations have not been introduced yet. So we're not sure which municipalities, but it will allow um, development authorized under certain aspects of the Planning Act to be exist, exempted from some of the existing uh, prohibitions. Um, with, which means municipalities will be able to um, forgo some, some of the conservation over authority oversight. One of the provisions that, um, that would be allowed would be uh, activities to straighten, change, divert, or interfere in any way with a, an existing channel of a river, creek, stream, water course, or a change or interfere in any way with a wetland. Um, so OFA's biggest concern with that, that in particular is what does that do to the farmer upstream or downstream if a water course is being um, changed in any way. So yeah, so, so removing some of the um, oversight that conservation authorities currently had um, of a, uh, we, we were very vocal about our concern about nearby properties being negatively impacted um, if a new development's coming in and the conservation authorities aren't reviewing uh, what, what could impact the neighbours. And there were no mechanisms that we saw that were put in place that would allow the, uh, a nearby property owner who was negatively impacted to, um, to remedy this. Uh, it, very similar to the MZOs that um, that uh, Emily was speaking about where the minister can override um, the conservation authority's concerns. And the minister is also now enabled to make regulations again, um, to maintain the conservation authority fees at current levels. Um, no such regulation is in place yet, but it could uh, impede a conservation authority's ability to adequate, adequately assess some of the potential impacts and again, for OFA, our, our concern there is that we want to make sure that the neighbors or the farmers who are who might be next to a new development going in are not are not negatively impacted. Next slide. So we also see that um, another thing that has been introduced is that the conservation authorities are being required to identify any of their conservation lands that may be suitable to be put into housing. And uh, a streamlined process has been developed for severing conservation authority lands to faci facilitate that development. Um, and why is this important to us? So currently there's over 3000 acres of conservation land rented to farmers. Um, so that, that land might end up into housing. And once again, the unintended consequences of, of of that land being used for housing. So what assurances do we have that the farmers and their agricultural lands will not come to bear the responsibility of the lost and farm mental and ecological services that these conservation authority lands would currently serve? Um, we, we don't need more requirements on, on farmland to provide environmental and ecological services. Next slide. So what I've what I've spoken about so far were the regulatory changes to the Conservation Authority Act through Bill 23. There uh, was another consultation 
about some um, legislative changes. Um, sorry, re uh, regulate changes to regulation. Uh, a decision has not been yet made about these proposals, but um, what I'm going to present is what was proposed. Uh, and again, so um, a benefit to us is they were looking for streamlining the approvals for some of the Conservation Authority um, approval process for certain activities. So um, they, they haven't spelled out yet what that would look like, uh, but good for us would be um, a streamlined process for installation of tile drains and maintenance or repair of existing tile drains that are not within a wetland or other area outside of the wetland. Um, so that, that would be great for us that, that we could streamline that. Installation and maintenance of an offline pond for watering livestock that is not connected to or within a water course or wetland and where no excavated materials develop is deposited within a water course. Um, with that particular one, uh, OFA did say, hey, we love that, but would you also um, add offline ponds that are use, used for irrigation purposes uh, to the streamlined approval process? Again, installation of agricultural infield erosion control measures with an outlet that is not directed or connected to a water course, wetland or a steep slope. And the uh, probably of biggest um, impact across the province for farmers is a streamlined process for maintenance and repair activities for existing municipal drains, including pipes, junction boxes, catch basins, um, Again, it would be done in accordance with the Draining Act and the Conservation Authorities Act protocol, but the getting the Conservation Authority approvals would be streamlined. Um, doesn't help us out with the municipality side getting getting it done, but one one step. The uh, well installation aspect, um, OFA did have some concerns with this becoming a streamlined process. Um, so it would be well installation that is not within hazardous lands or a wetland, including private drilled or bored water well installation and the installation of municipal monitoring wells. Again, our concern with that having a streamlined process is uh, because of farmers relying on private wells for both their domestic uses as, as well as agricultural uses, including watering of livestock. Um, we want to make sure that there are insurances that well installations will remain robust um, and really ensure that protection of the water quality and quantity for our aquifers and the existing wells. And next slide, please. Uh, also proposed in the legislative changes was uh, the definition of a water course. Um, this is something OFA has been asking for a very long time. So we were, we were happy to see this. So it, water course would be a defined channel having a bed and banks or sides. There have been, um, this has been a source of uh, controversy for many farmers with um, conservation authorities, certain conservation authorities, um, where, where, where a spring channel, a, you know, or, or a little spot in the field has all of a sudden been deemed a water course. So, so this is something we've asked for for quite a while. And also part of the legislative changes was um, the conservation authorities uh, being asked to develop program service delivery standards. So some standards in, in turnaround time for when someone would hear back or have a decision about, um, about an application uh, for a permit. Um, uh, uh, OFA is uh, obviously we're in favor of this because we think people need to know how, how long it's gonna take for, for these permits to be issued. Um, we did advocate that these standards be provincially determined so that property owners throughout Ontario, wherever conservation authorities operate, which is most of Southern Ontario, uh, that they will all face the same service delivery standards. Um, we do have many members who farm maybe in, in uh, areas that are covered by different conservation authorities. Um, so having, having a, a known uh, sta um, delivery standard time, knowing how long it'll take to get their permit approved or, or to hear back um, 
is very important. Uh, we did recognize that the challenge is that not all conservation authorities have the same levels of funding to be able to do this and that that needs to be considered. Um, so that concludes sort of my summary of some of the changes that we've seen to the Conservation Authorities Act and the regulations. And um, again, it remains to be seen how this will play out on the ground at, at the end of the day. Um, but that's what we know so far. So I will turn it back to Danielle now to bring us to the question period time. Just before we go to Danielle, I just have a few uh, summer wrap up comments. Thanks, Tina, for your presentation on changes to the Conservation Authorities Act. So um, just before we get into questions and answers, I just have a few things I want to leave people with today. So, of course, what else is on the table? I know there's been a lot of chatter in the chat about other changes that were made recently, not specifically as part of Bill 23, but part of the whole suite of provincial um, changes to build more homes faster. So, of course, um, <clears throat> Bill, we saw Bill 39, the Better Municipal Governments Act, was passed, which revokes the Duffins Roos Ag Agricultural Preserve, a protected areas of thousands of acres of Class 1 farmland within the GTA. Um, we've also recently seen a consultation on changes to Ontario's wetland evaluation system, um, you know, specifically a proposal to pave over wetlands for housing and offset them elsewhere. Um, of course, a hot button topic, despite virtually 50,000 comments opposing the proposal, the changes to the green belt were approved, where we now see the loss of 7,400 acres of prime farmland being um, uh, permitted for housing development. And finally, just uh, consultation closed on New Year's Eve, a proposal to merge the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe and the provincial policy statement as one updated province-wide document. So the uh, provincial policy statement or the PPS, of, um, for those of you who may be unaware, is the statement of the government's policies on land use planning. And it applies province-wide and provides a clear policy direction on land use planning to promote strong communities, strong economy, and a clean and healthy environment. The growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe is a regional growth management policy for the Greater Golden Horseshoe area of Southern Ontario, providing rules about where growth, like housing, employment, and transportation should go for approximately 110 municipalities. The plan identifies density and intensification targets, urban growth centers, strategic employment areas, and settlement area restrictions designed to mitigate negative environmental, economic, and human health impacts associated with sprawling and uncoordinated growth within this region. So while the province looks to merge both the PPS and the growth plan uh, within this past consultation. We've yet to see the final document. I just want to remind everybody that it's important to note that the proposal does not necessarily mean the growth plan policies will suddenly apply all over Ontario. It means the province is looking to take components perhaps that they like of each policy or plan and uh, perhaps even omit the policy provisions that they view could be seen as red tape to building housing and then combine the two together as one combined policy regime. So this means things perhaps like um, that protect agriculture could be seen as red tape, such as MDS or agricultural impact assessments, and perhaps they are at risk of being removed from this new PPS. So um, what can you do? Given that the world of land use planning is changing rapidly and uh, some of our ability to get involved in the local level is being stifled, many people have been asking over the last couple of months, what can they do? So I have just a few tips that I want to leave um, people with, whether you're part of an organization or concerned citizen or individual. So, of course, um, most of these will apply at the municipal level because this is where we're going to be seeing changes occurring within the next couple of months. So, you know, if there is an application or policy review, find out as much as possible about it. Ask questions about how it affects you, your property or agriculture in the local community within the short and the long term. Go to information sessions, including open houses and public meetings where they are still being provided. Give your opinions, ask questions and get clarity. Contact your planning department, build that relationship with your planning department. I'm telling you they're a resource there for you to use. To learn details of, um, about the policy review or application and get their professional opinion on the proposal. Be sure to discuss the proposal with municipal staff from perhaps all departments, get different perspectives, whether that's from building, finance, economic development, planning, engineering, and of course, your councillors. And then you can also engage with the local Federation of Agriculture or your zone director as part of the OFA board of directors. And as an individual or concerned citizen, call your MPP and voice your concerns, continue to do so. Um, I know many people have, and I have to commend everybody for their action on this front. 
And of course, you can mobilize with other members in your area to have a bigger impact. Um, raise your concerns with the Agricultural Advisory Committee if you do have one, and learn about other community or stakeholder groups' positions on the issue. Make a written or verbal delegation, uh, sorry, written submission or verbal delegation to your council. And if uh, perhaps if a planning application comes up, and this is a big thing that I encounter in my portfolio and assisting members at OFA, if a public engagement or a public commenting session is underway, such as to gather input on uh, an official plan review or specific application, and you need more time to provide comment, need more time, most of the time they will say yes and be, be willing to accept your comments afterwards. Um, and a key, key, key thing here is to make council aware of your concerns early in the process. And be sure if you do or if you do have the ability to appeal as a third party, know how to protect your appeal rights and defend your position accordingly. And then, of course, there are um, various guides on land use planning and other resource guides out there if you're more curious about process details and whatnot. Um, some of those may be out of date, so I just caution people when using external resources to recognize there have been a number of changes over the last couple of months, um, and just to bear those in mind. And then, of course, if you do have questions, you can contact me or any other member of the research team at OFA as it pertains to our files, and I will put my email in the chat as I cover the farm property and land use files at OFA. So I will thank you all for listening. That's the end of our presentation, and I'm going to pass it back to Danielle to um, take us through the question and answer period. Perfect. Thank you so much for all of your presentations and thanks to everyone in the chat for such a lively discussion. Uh, so um, I will ask uh, Ben to come back on camera as well. And uh, we will start off with Emily. I have an anonymous question for you uh, that relates to land use planning being under provincial jurisdiction and what should or could be done at the federal level to ensure farmland is protected. Yeah, that's a that is a great question. And I think that's so much part of the challenge of trying to protect farmland and um, and navigate these land use planning issues and, and come across with a coordinated approach across the country, because it is a provincial um, uh, provincial matter. And it's as we can see, for, I'll, and I'll use BC as an example, you know, we do see some stark contrasts in terms of how farmland is being protected. Um, it, of course, I would say at the federal level, there needs to be greater emphasis with either within legislation or policy on the protection of natural resources, of course, um, and, you know, maybe perhaps planning um, still remains to be a provincial um, um, responsibility, and of course, but to perhaps, I don't know, put some put some sort of legislation in place to protect these resources, because, you know, we can't even think about this as um, putting protections and, and making decisions that protect farmland on individual scales, such as we see here with, um, you know, we have uh, the provincial policy statement in Ontario, but then we have individual municipal decisions. And what we've been seeing over time is a fragmentation of that farmland and that farm base, uh, land base, I should say. So having a more, being able to bring this uh, further up to the top and to provide a more coordinated response to protecting that land base and the continuity of that land base, um, you know, so the fragmentation is limited. Um, is something that I think, of course, will need to be a um, priority or a possibility in, in coming years because we are losing more and more of it across this country beyond Ontario. Perfect. Thank you, Emily. And our next question uh, is for Ben. So we had the same question from a couple of people on the line. Uh, and it was really about how the province plans to compensate municipalities uh, and how that might work. Is, is the promise and policy somewhere or is it just handshakes with select mayors? Yeah, so uh, currently, I think the problem is currently there is no plan to uh, compensate municipalities. I think there's been uh, maybe the occasional nod towards it's possible, but our our we've been advocating that a, first of all, yeah, like I said, don't make these changes for all the reasons we mentioned, but now that that seems to, to be in the bag that there should be compensation. That doesn't mean that there will be compensation. How would they compensate it? Um, it would, as you know, this kind of ties into some comments I heard, uh, saw elsewhere in the chat that 
yes, there is kind of one pat tax there, right? Whether we're talking about property taxes or income tax or capital gains or what have you. Um, so it it no matter what, even if it, the the province does transfer um, enough funds to municipalities to make them whole, it still is a transfer of costs from developers to to taxpayers, right? Um, uh, at that point, we're, we're at, I guess we're we're beyond the perfect solution points, and and so. Um, where would the where funds come from? Would you come from general provincial funding and whether they needed to uh, further increase in other tax, sales tax, income tax, cut costs somewhere else to cover those costs? Unclear at this point. Um, but the main thing is that um, <clears throat> our, our farm members have already had a significant hit to property taxes over the last decade. And this would be Potentially of a similar magnitude of what we've already seen, and you know, right, I, I think many members have hit the limit of of double digit per year increases in property taxes, and and the fact of the matter is that the province has more financial resources than municipalities do. Municipalities are, you know, legislated to run a, a, a balanced budget. Um, they have only two revenue tools really they control, and property tax and development charges. So, if the province wants to significantly hamper one of their two tools. Um, it, it should be on them to, to cover the costs. But again, how, how, if, when all that would happen, all very unclear at this point. Great, thanks, Ben. And um, another question for you around uh, the definition of attainable housing. There's been some challenges getting a definition from the municipality. Yeah, I've heard, uh, you know, kind of just from, from news clippings and, and, following this, other municipalities and treasurers frustrated with a lack of definition of that term and, and a concern that uh, essentially what might happen is the, the attainable housing that uh, is receiving this discount may not be all that attainable. Um, so it, it, which would just be a double, double bad because we've now again shifted more um, cost to property taxes uh, and haven't really potentially, if, if that were to happen, not achieved the desired outcome of more affordable, attainable housing. So there definitely needs to be a clear definition of what what properties, what development would be um, eligible for that uh, to ensure that um, the policy goal of having more attainable housing gets reached and we're not just uh, spending money for, for no return. Great, thanks, Ben. And now we'll turn it over to Tina. So uh, first question was, will we see layoffs at conservation authorities and upper tier municipal planning departments as a result of Bill 23? Um, I, I would assume most likely. Um, can't, can't say definitively, but uh, for conservation authorities, I'd say it's quite likely um, for, for upper tier planning. I think Emily would probably agree that that is a most likely as well. Uh, Emily, did you have any comments? Yeah, with respect to upper tier um, and regional planning authorities, it's something I wanna make clear is that this, this, this change has not yet come into effect. So currently, you know, regional planning authorities still have their mandate. Um, what is happening um, is that later on a date will be set where those changes need to be made. The process that is underway is, uh, I believe the province is calling it a sort of facilitation process to help decide or, or discuss and kind of envision this transition of downloading uh, regional responsibilities to the lower tier level. So not sure if those are underway yet. I, I have to update myself on those that timeline, but just to know in some of those areas, um, that process will be underway in a couple of months. And in terms of layoffs, um, that's, of course, probably too early to speak to. Unfortunately, I know within the planning realm, um, there are concerns that, of course, without, you know, the very definition of upper tiers without um, planning authorities or planning responsibilities in the Planning Act, that pretty much presumes that planning planners will not be uh, operating at the, the upper tier level, unfortunately. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Tina, again, will the change in conservation authority mandate negatively affect their farmer landowner services like BMP, best management practice grants and technical advice? So I think for that one, it will probably um, be dependent uh, 
conservation authority by conservation authority. Um, but this was part of the changes made in 2019 and 2020. Uh, so conservation authorities do still have the ability to make an agreement with municipalities um, for providing um, this kind of advice and supports for BMPs, um, technical advice. Uh, but but again, the funding of it would they have to look at how it would be funded um, and what kind of agreements uh, are in place, either with municipalities or other agencies. But um, so yeah, it'll depend on uh, the municipality, uh, the conservation authorities being able to uh, afford staff for for that and what kind of agreements are put in place. Great, thanks, Tina. Um, go to Emily again with uh, a general question. Is there somewhere to go to learn about each of the types of farmland protection different provinces have and to compare them? I have heard Quebec and BC offer better protection. Ontario seems to give farmland secondary consideration compared to all other land uses. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I'd say um, I know the Greenbelt Foundation has produced a number of research outputs comparing green belts in other jurisdictions. I think I believe BC and um, Quebec were included in that, and as well as elsewhere around the world. Um, of course, uh, you know those own government websites will have resources available. Um, but I would suggest uh, right here in our own province, the Greenbelt Foundation was doing a really great job of, of providing um, that cross-jurisdictional analysis of what's occurring elsewhere. Thanks, Emily. Um, ben, as you watch municipal budgets, do you see the federal jurisdiction over the commons, aka our air and water, as helpful? By now, it's financial analysis. There's a price tag to emergency relief, floods, and other pollution dysregulation. There's a price tag to food security. Basically, does the OFA have a channel for federal assistance? And I know some of this is environmental, so perhaps Tina might want to weigh in as well. Yeah. Um... As it relates to the changes to development charges, I, I wouldn't, you know, hold out hope that the federal government is going to provide any compensation to municipalities or um, be involved in this in any way. Um, so I, I do think this probably is more of an environmental. So, you know, on my files, do I see any federal involvement in this? No. Yeah, and, and with, with some of the environmental side, um, uh, again, we see more releasing of uh, disaster relief um, funding <laughs> if if there is severe flooding, um, that type of thing. So uh, I can't say that I foresee any federal, um, specific federal assistance coming for this outside of the one-off, um, you know, emergency funding that's provided. Great, and we have a question here uh, that would go for Emily. There were some articles in the Farm Press in late 2022 that indicated that the farmland loss of 319 acres per day calculated by Stats Can is overstated. Can the speakers address what the basis of those articles was? Also, I'm still confused what actually defines farmland loss. Is some of the farmland that has been rezoned but still being farmed at this time counted as lost as it will eventually be developed? Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics. So I, I won't be able to speak to the specific articles as there's quite a number. I'm not sure which one specifically you're referring to. So Dave, if you have a chance, if you could put them in the chat so I could look those up afterwards, that would be fantastic. Um, in terms of what actually defines farmland loss. So um, there is no standard definition for farmland loss. Uh, there are various ways to measure it. And I just want to maybe just take a moment to kind of go through those. And I apologize, I didn't have that much time in my presentation to kind of distinguish the two, but I tried. Um, so at OFA, when we are referring to the number of 319 acres of farmland, that is referring to the numbers that are calculated within the, the census. So as I mentioned in my presentation, it is the number of farmland acres that are in production on census day. So, you know, farmer gets the census, fills it out, how many acres am I actively farming right now? That's the answer. Um, and we have been seeing that number decrease over time. And what that tells us is that, um, you know, it's, and to clarify, it's not all, um, not lost just to urban development. Perhaps, um, as I mentioned, you know, 
a farmer may have just not been producing anything for whatever reason on that on that field, so they didn't count it in the census. Um, the uh, perhaps an aggregate operation has moved in that's not actively being farmed anymore. Any um, and let's say farmland that has been designated. Um, so, for instance, uh, a farmer is renting it from a developer um, that even though it's destined for development, it's still going to be counted in the census as active farmland. So the census is not a fantastic way of getting a most accurate and timely picture of farmland loss. The long term story of the census does tell us since, you know, the uh, 90s that we have been losing farmland over time. Um, as you know, people are saying that the number of farm of 319 acres a day is overstated. Um, you know, it is an estimation. It's not perfect. Um, and unfortunately, when it comes to urban development, you know, the province used to have these numbers available. Um, we no longer have that information. So in order to get a more accurate picture of farmland loss, especially that is being lost to urban development, we have to look to municipalities and the data that they have available on um, you know, official plan amendments or zoning bylaw amendments, because we know that once that has been designated, even though a farmer might be farming it for 10, 15, 20 years, we know eventually it's going to be paved over for farmland. I mean, paved over for urban development. It is very tricky to get that designation back because of the value of that designation on that property. So that's what we would count as a loss. Um, the University of Guelph, um, I will put a plug out there for Dr. Wayne Caldwell and Dr. Sarah Epp at the University of Guelph are actively getting these numbers on farmland loss to urban development through these redesignations. I believe their updated numbers up to 2022 will be available soon. Um, um, so that is some of my uh, clarification there, my quick Coles notes. It's a very complex matter in terms of how we actually measure it. What do these numbers mean? Um, and I'd be happy to chat offline. I'll put an, my email in the chat to help answer any further questions on that topic. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Tina, I think this would probably be the bet. It's kind of more broad than, than what you presented on today, but um, what proactive measures are currently being worked on, such as strengthening normal farm practices, higher levels of compensation for livestock due to loss of habitat, et cetera? So a bit of a broad question. And if anyone else wants to jump in, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, so, so this does um, cover over some of our other policy researchers area. Um, I do know that we are uh, quite forward with maintaining the, um, the compensation programs. Um, but, and in terms of normal farm practices, that that is very clearly defined in the legislation, but we do stay on top of um, on top of that to ensure that it's being uh, enforced um, as as intended. Um, and and I think uh, you know hold, holding sessions like this is is part of it, um, trying to keep our members and everyone out there informed of the potential impact and encouraging. Um, as Emily's last little bit did it presented, encouraging everyone to go out and have their say um, to the people who are making these decisions. Um, if anyone else has anything further to add, oh, and I should add, sorry, just before that, that um, you know we are also uh, very actively involved with the healthy soils initiatives as well, um, as well as the biodiversity discussions. Um, so that we are, you know, we, we are involved with those as well. Danielle, can I ask you to repeat the question? <laughs> I have some input on normal farm practice, but I just want to make sure I'm going to get to the, the crux of the, the question there. I'd already taken it out of my, my uh, notes here, trying to keep on top of what I've asked and haven't. Um, I remember it was from Nancy. Let me just back up in the chat. Okay. Um, what proactive measures are currently being worked on? For example, strengthening normal farm practices, higher levels of compensation for livestock due to loss of habitat, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of existing and I think um, other um, policy measures that could perhaps be strengthened going forward that I especially think it's important to make our members and county federations more aware of when it comes to normal farm practices. So, of course, we have the Normal Farm Practices Protection Board, which protects 
normal farm practices such as dust, odor, light, vibration, smoke, noise, I think one more, flies that I'm missing, um, and your ability to um, continue farming um, without having to deal with certain nuisance complaints. So, you know, it could be on a one-on-one -on -one dispute where you take that to the, or perhaps somebody takes it to the, um, it's a one-on-one -on -one dispute between you and your neighbor and it goes to the Normal Farm Practices Protection Board. Of course, everybody would like to avoid that, but that's a mechanism to help protect you as well as um, bylaws, municipal bylaws that may perhaps impede your ability to continue with normal farm practices. So I know, um, you know, bylaws, I'll use an example about light or uh, livestock guardian dogs and the noise that they may create and how those may unduly restrict farmers' activities. So going forward, it's a very important to ensure that exemptions for normal farm practices are in those bylaws, perhaps as they get updated because we've got more and more people moving into rural areas potentially. Um, to ensure that those exemptions are written directly into the bylaw. As well, something else that has been on the radar a bit that has been coming up within my files is um, municipalities putting a development um, agreement criteria within their official plans requiring, um, you know, the, essentially an agreement um, recognizing that normal farm practices or the agricultural activities will be taking place um, is acknowledged and tied to the title of a um, sale of a property. So to be able to speak with your municipality and see if those sorts of provisions are within the official plan so that, you know, when the developer comes along and they get their development agreement, that that sort of agreement would be written directly into their um, development agreement. I'm going to stop saying development agreement. Um, the <laughs> Um, and to, so that would be tied to the title of the land once it is sold. I know that's another mechanism that people are having to look forward to. Um, it's not one that I want to put out there. We, you know, it's unfortunate in all this Bill 23 talk because we shouldn't have to be going to these mechanisms in the first place. Like we should be planning on a more coordinated scale to avoid these compatib compatibility issues um, longer term and across the broader landscape, but unfortunately it's getting down to the individual property level where now people are needing to look for those mechanisms to help protect them in their agricultural operations. So those are just two more things I wanted to bring up in, with respect to normal farm practices, the things that you guys can do. Perfect, thank you so much, Emily. Um, we're gonna go kind of broad here. There were a couple of questions that were generally for all of you um, and uh, so we'll start off with, out of all the policy outlined today under the bill, what policy misstep do you anticipate being the one that could contribute the most or have the largest impact around farmland loss in terms of putting more at risk for loss? What is the greatest concern in OFA's view? And I'm going to tack on another question, which was, what would you like to have as an outcome and how do you obtain it? So that was, I think that's kind of related to what's the biggest issue and then what kind of would OFA like to see? I can maybe start um, with respect to to my files. Um, you know, it's it's tough. Um, I I think we would view a lot of these concerns as as equally, or a lot of these policy um, changes as equally concerning. What um, perhaps is quite concerning is the removal of regional planning authorities. Those were introduced, you know, some 50 years ago for the exact reason that we have them today. And now they're being um, proposed to be removed again, um, you know, without regional planning authorities, which their job is to help, you know, allocate that growth within to, to your lower tier counterparts um, and to help manage and dictate where growth goes. But if, you know, we're leaving that now to individual um, municipalities, perhaps we could be seeing further fragmentation of farmland, um, uh, more scattered and inefficient and, and piecemeal development that really would just, um, you know, takes away from community livability, but also makes municipal servicing much more expensive because it's not that coordinated. Um, in terms of an outcome, Something else I, um, I'll point out in that, um, you know, OFA has been asking for greater um, collaboration and, and I guess more meaningful consultation with Ministry of Municipal Affairs specifically, we look forward to building those relationships is to, um, you know, to, to look exactly at the consultation process. Like we are seeing these changes being legislated before we even have the chance to provide our feedback. And so I think people can presume what that means. 
um, you know, whether or not um, our, our, we're actually being listened to or, or our um, ideas are actually being heard. Um, so I know going forward, we look forward to building those relationships with the various provincial ministries to, to um, you know, allow for more meaningful consultation and to have our ideas heard and to continue providing solutions so we can avoid some of these policy missteps going forward. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in, I'll be quick on mine. Um, as the kind of finance person, my, from my files perspective, uh, I think the, the biggest concern I see is the potential for farmers being financially squeezed on, on both ends of this, either through increased property taxes and through potentially fighting, having to fight for or potentially losing some of our um, development charge exemptions as a result of these changes. So a successful outcome would be um, OFA's long-standing position of a province-wide exemption for farmland development charges um, for you know, bona fide farm structures by farmers, um, as well as um, some type of compensation at this point for municipalities to prevent that situation where we're seeing significant increase in property tax burden. It's, it's been one thing to see property tax burden increase as a result of the market forces of farmland value. It's another thing to have a similar level of tax increase due to a policy decision at the provincial level. So those would be the two things I, I would see a successful outcome is a province-wide exemption for development charges and funding to uh, municipalities to prevent uh, significant property tax increases as a result. Um, those are both at the federal level, but all of our county federations and our members can be very helpful in terms of um, gaining support for this type of issue. We definitely in the new year will be working with our rural communities, Western Wardens, Eastern Wardens, Roma, et cetera, to discuss kind of what the fallout of these changes will be financially and, and how we might be able to work with our rural communities to ensure we don't see that um, situation where, where this is going to have a dramatically negative financial impact on, on farmers and, and other property taxpayers as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. And um, I believe this one is, is one of our policy analysts who isn't on the line. Um, most of us are here today, but uh, it's a question about uh, energy policy, which is our our analyst Ian Noakes. So I'm not I'm not sure anyone here can answer it, but he's asking what the link is between IESO and Bill 23, if any, specifically regarding the provincial ability to allow battery or other generation contracts from the IESO to go ahead, regardless of municipal or public opposition. So um, no pressure if if we don't have the answer directly, but I'm sure we can follow up uh, with Ian and get that answer. I'll, I'll jump in. I've worked a little bit with Ian on this topic, um, but I um, won't say anything definitively. I know um, when it comes to planning specifically, there are certain projects where planning is not actually involved within some of these considerations, which makes it which does make it challenging in order to um, go ahead and ensure, you know, compatible development between some of these energy proposals and, and the rest of the community. Great, thanks, Emily. Uh, there was a question here about a conversation that farmland is going to be lost. Sorry, there was a conversation that the farmland that is going to be lost is going to be replaced from land from other areas. So I guess that would be like a land swap. So is the land that is to be released available to be farmed immediately, or is it forested land that is crowned land? Um. So I'm a little unsure of what the question is referring to specifically. I'm wondering if it's referring to the green belt swap that we saw happen. Um, so there have been um, areas already identified with respect to the green belt to swap out 7,400 acres of prime agricultural land um, for, I think, I believe it's like 9,200 other acres or 9,400 acres elsewhere um, across the province. Um, that land that has been swapped, so this, this has already been approved, is actually mostly um, urban river valleys or is under already under public control or is within a floodplain. And so um, it makes the question regarding the validity of this land swap, uh, I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense because you wouldn't be able to build or develop on there in the first place anyway. They're already under public ownership. 
Um, so in terms of farming, I, I doubt it. Like it's very um, limited, I guess, in terms of their capability or possibility to do that. Um, in terms of other proposals, I mean, I've heard arguments that we could take land in the south and open up land in the north, but I think that um, goes against, and we need to remember the continuity of agricultural land bases and how important that is for farming and our environment, as well as, um, you know, it's the presumption that all land is created equally and, and can be substituted as a result, and that's just simply not true. We need to protect what limited land we have. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and there was some conversations, again, kind of at the federal level, and, and we work mostly at the provincial level. So I'll kind of summarize the comments, and then if anyone has anything they'd like to reflect on or add. Uh, so on the federal agri-land protection chat, there is the new biodiversity agreement that could be used to preserve farmland, couldn't it? Something to advocate. And then there was a response, if you mean the recent federal signatory to the UN Convention on Biodiversity, unfortunately, there is no extra legal protections that come with this agreement, but it could be used as an advocacy discussion. Perhaps the feds could intervene or apply pressure. Uh, and then related to that, what advocacy role can we play to the federal government on farmland preservation, considering the COP15 obligations to land conservation? So again, I know we, we often work in the provincial space. So uh, if anyone had anything they wanted to comment related to those, there's also a, uh, an excellent point in the chat from uh, Senator Rob Black. Thank you so much for joining us today. The Senate of Canada is currently undertaking a cross-Canada soil health study and uh, how that could potentially help with this land use planning issues that we're seeing um, and some recommendations. So um, that's a great point that hopefully there's, there's some positives that can come out of that conversation as well. Um, I think I'll just jump in here and say that, um, you know, that is part of the challenge being a provincial organization. We're not directly involved with these federal um, level concerns regarding farmland, especially that it is a, a planning is a provincial jurisdiction, but perhaps it is a role for a Canadian Federation of Agriculture to get involved. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight, I know Bronwyn Wilton and Sarah McDonald from the um, Green Belt Foundation both have put resources in the chat regarding um, farmland protection policies and green belts in other jurisdictions, just as another additional resource into what I mentioned. So thank you both for that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to sneak one more question in at 129. Um, so it is my understanding that the government has not introduced higher density standards except for promoting ultra high density communities around transit lines. Is there any indication why they wouldn't have done this from a planning perspective? I believe denser housing can also be built faster while conserving land. Um, yeah, to quickly answer, I don't know why. <laughs> I, th I think there's quite a few proposals that have been passed that uh, simply don't make sense. I know that's something we've been advocating for at OFA, and so unfortunately I don't have any um, greater rationale as to why perhaps they haven't gone that direction. Perfect. Thank you so much, Emily. Okay, so with that, that's all the time we have for today. As mentioned earlier, the recording and the slide deck will be available on OFA's website following the webinar. Wanted to thank you all for joining us today and thank you so much to all of our speakers for their insights. They've all shared their emails in the chat and uh, we encourage you to continue the conversation and we appreciate all the uh, advocacy and energy that you've put into uh, this topic moving forward. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us today.